Well, good morning, good morning. We want to thank Miss Linnell for playing for us today. Yep, yep. Thank you. You're very kind. You're very kind. We have sent Lori to the children today. Ambassador. She's an ambassador to the children today. So I'm not sure who we need to pray for the most, <coughs> the children or Lori, but I'm feeling we're going to have a fun day. Okay. <clears throat> Miss Joy and her family are ill this morning, so we're all scrambling to help her find her places and, and do what we need to do to help her. <clears throat> so uh, this is the month of Av, in case anybody forgot what month you're in. This is the 24th day of Av, 5782. And most of us look at it as this is Sunday, August the 21st. I used to think, you know, I had enough trouble keeping up with the regular calendar, I called it, before I introduced myself to the Hebrew calendar. Then, <laughs> Gary, Gary will say to me, are we in Ishri Atla? You know, <laughs> what? Yeah, he's like, he can never quite get the exact names of the month, okay, and he kind of runs them all together. Okay. And Ob's a little easier. Ob's good for him, he likes Ob. <laughs> so I, I tell people, I said, what, how it helped me is on my phone, I actually have a setting so I can introduce the Hebrew calendar into my regular calendar. So on my regular calendar, it puts my Hebrew date so it kind of helps me keep up with where are we at and what are we doing and, and things like that <clears throat> but the biggest thing is it's not as important to know what day of Av you are in <laughs> as it is to know what Av means to you what is Av supposed to be for you um, and we've talked a lot this month specifically about going into the promised land and this is the month to find your promised land this is the month that we should have gone into the promised land as the children of Israel, but they did. They messed up and listened to the other report. But this is also the month to receive God's promise. So I want to talk about that today. To receive God's promise, but we were supposed to receive God's promise, and our part was we were supposed to mix it with faith. Okay. A lot of times we hear people, and they know the promises of God. They know what God's supposed to be giving us, so to speak, what blessings we're supposed to be walking in. But it just stays out there. It never becomes part of them. They never mix it with faith and say, okay, I want that. I'm going to put that in me. I'm going I'm to accept that, come into agreement with that. <clears throat> so... One of the interesting things about this month, and I'm just going to read uh, from our book, A Time to Advance, that Chuck Pierce does about all the months and everything. This is the, um, and this is where I want to start. This is the month you're supposed to be grafted into an inheritance. If you are a blood-bought Christian, you are grafted into the covenant of Abraham. But in that covenant, there were and are iniquitous patterns. Okay. Through the blood of Jesus, all things are reconciled, but the devil will try to activate these iniquitous patterns and cause them to manifest. If you have instability in your bloodline, does anybody have instability in their bloodline? <laughs> Do we have anybody that doesn't? We want them to pray for us because <laughs> they've gotten something the rest of us have not. But if you have instability in your bloodline, there are times when you must have spiritual disciplines in place so that a spirit does not come in and wipe you out. Okay? Here's how the devil's workers operate. They're, they are no respecters of persons and they do not play fair. If they see that you're having a bad day, they'll swarm you, okay? They do not back off just because you are struggling. They will take opportunity to try and convince you to align with them. They understand iniquitous patterns. When Satan was kicked out of heaven, iniquity was found in him. 
Therefore, any time we agree with him, a root forms. A root forms. Any time you agree with him, a root forms. Roots are little hard things to pull out. Okay? This is why we must deal with the roots in our generations. This is also why God will deal with you all year long and give you opportunities to repent and be delivered. He can always deliver you, but you must choose to walk in freedom. There is a difference. Okay. So many people we have delivered over the years, but they don't choose to walk in freedom. They choose to go back to the familiar. Or when it gets too hard, they give in to it and they go, let's do, let's just do this other way. It's easier. It's really hard to fight the devil. How many of you realize that? Especially if there are roots in you or you've agreed with him. When we come out of agreement, things begin to change. This is also the month that the lion roars. Okay. <clears throat> now we all recognize that Jesus is the lion and he roars. But it, we also have to recognize, recognize Jesus has created us to be that lion that roars. That's a different thinking. We all expect Jesus to roar. He is the lion. But he's wanting us to roar. This is a very prophetic month. This month is supposed to be a month when we as the body of Christ are roaring. We are roaring out the prophecies of God. Uh, <clears throat> when the people of God roar, there's a prophetic covering that is created. Isn't that interesting? That's what it's talking about in Amos. It's about unlocking what is above you, what has not been released, and, and redoing it. In other words, what we are doing when we do a prophetic roar is we are hearing the roar of Jesus, and we are just resounding it. Okay? We are resounding it. What happens when we resound it? We come in alignment with him. We come in agreement with him. And what changes is all those other sounds that we were roaring don't get to have the same power. Because now we're roaring the sounds of God or the prophetic sounds of God. <clears throat> in Amos uh, chapter 3, verse 7 and 8, this is what it says. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his servants, the prophets. So that's why in this prophetic month, not all of you are prophets, but each of you can prophesy. Hear me again. <coughs> not all of you are prophets, but every person that's born again can prophesy because Holy Spirit will give you that word. He'll give you that sound. He'll give you that notion. And you're supposed to roar your sound or create your sound. Verse 8 says, A lion has roared who will fear. The Lord God has spoken who can but prophesy. So when you feel the Lord um, rising up inside of you, when you feel him wanting to release a sound over your family or your house or your business or thousands of other things, you need to realize how important it is for you to release that sound because it's literally a prophetic covering that will now come over you. If the children of Israel, if all 12 of them had released the sound of God, they would have all come back saying the same report. Do you see that? But 10 of them <coughs> did not release the sound of God in their lives. They released fear. So the question becomes this morning, what are we resounding from God? Are you hearing what God's sound is and resounding it? That's what we're all supposed to be doing. When we read the word, we're supposed to be taking that word, the word of God, and resounding it, re-saying it, re-declaring it, re-decreeing it. But the problem is, most of us don't resound God's love. We don't resound his praise. We don't resound his joy. What do we resound? Fear, doubt, unbelief, all of those things. So what happens is in this month, when you are sounding a sound because it's a prophetic month, that sound is what's created over you. 
that sound is created over you. So instead of re resounding the sounds like the two um, Joshua and Caleb did, where they resounded faith and they resounded trust and they gave it all up, instead of resounding that sound, what we ended up with was the sound of fear. The sound of fear and doubt and unbelief. It also has to do with your emotions. When you release unredeemed emotions, you have released a prophetic covering over you. So that covering draws all the things from the atmosphere to reinforce what you've just released. You getting that? I wish you guys could see the color of what you release. If you could see the colors of your unredeemed emotions, if you could see it visibly, if you could see when I sleep like this, this is what happens. <coughs> if you could see how it creates a perfect atmosphere for disease, if you could see that, I just have a feeling you might not be as willing to just give that stuff out. Or at least that's my hope. Some of you might like those colors. I don't know. Gary's favorite color is gray. <laughs> is it still gray? Pretty close, okay. <laughs> and I was like, that's not even a color. He goes, but I like that color. So last Wednesday, if you want to have more information about what are you releasing about fear and unbelief and unredeemed emotions, last Wednesday I went into depth and detail. So that will be online. Is it already on there? It's already on there. So you can go back and listen to that to help you understand what are some of the steps you can use to get out of that particular place? But here we're learning how to walk. So we're supposed to be in the promised land. We're supposed to learn how to walk into it. We're supposed to discover it somehow. And we're somehow supposed to abide in the promised land. That's our instructions for this month. But the promised land, I think everybody's still trying to figure out what is the promised land. What does it look like? We recognize this month some of the giants that we've seen in our land, okay? Uh, we recognize some of the giants we've seen in us. But one of the ways to find out the, where the promised land is, is what we've been talking about, is you've got to resound the sounds or the frequencies of God. You've got to get to the place where, <clears throat> let me see if I can explain it like this. When I pray, when I praise, what comes out of me are the sounds of praise and worship and adoration. It's the sound of love and declaration. It's all these things. And when I release them into the atmosphere, <coughs> it's very much like a cleansing. It cleanses away the things that aren't supposed to be in my atmosphere. So I can see more clearly and I can feel more accurately God in my life. Okay. So when you're resounding, you have to hear the sounds of God. Now, a lot of people don't feel they hear God. They don't, like I've had many say to me, well, he doesn't talk to me like he talks to you. And I go, yes, he does. He talks to everybody the same. The problem is, is you've created these barriers and walls where he can't get through. Or you've got so much noise going on that you can't tell it's his voice because there are too many voices speaking. Have you ever been in the <coughs> middle of a big room full of everybody that's given permission to talk and how hard it is to have a conversation? Like you go to a restaurant and it's, there are several restaurants here in town. It's just so loud. You cannot have a conversation because all, everybody else's voice is as loud or louder than your voice is. So I can't tell you how many times I've been all but screaming and then it seems like there's a quiet moment and I'm the one screaming. You know, everybody's looking at me. Why are you screaming? I okay. can't hear you. Okay. A lot of times we do that with God. We create these atmospheres where all the voices get to be really, really loud. And then we wonder why we can't hear God. So one of the things we have to do is figure out how do we shut down those voices? How do we get to the place where we have an actual calm place where we were doing that? Well, we know that we were created to praise him. Does anybody doubt that? <clears throat> That's why he created us. 
is to have a family, to have that, that camaraderie and for us to be able to praise him. But did you also realize that all of creation was created to praise him? Yeah. All of creation, all the animals, all the plants, the sun, the moon, the stars, all of them were created to praise him. Um, and they had the capacity to praise him. Now, we're sitting here thinking, okay, how does a plant praise God? Well, we know plants have frequencies. And we know that they are somehow in tune to, some plants are so uh, geocentric that they can just follow the sun, right? Okay. We know that they have this somehow knowing when it's summer and winter and fall. They know these seasons, okay? Gary was pretty hysterical the other day. He goes, come and look at this bird. And I'm like, oh my gosh, we got another bird. But it's on his phone. <laughs> and, this, and I was like, okay. And this bird, correct me if I get this wrong, but he, he originated in South Africa. Okay. And this bird, for his flight uh, pattern that he did every summer, he would go straight north till he got to Europe. Well, what you could see on this pattern, they had tagged this bird, and they had watched his migration all the way. And so when he got to the really desert places where he could not have water, he just scooted over a little bit to get to the Nile, kind of went up the Nile. <laughs> okay. And then once he was over the Mediterranean, he kind of scooted back to where he would be right in line with going all the way up to Europe. He was going, what was it at? 200 and something miles a day, something like that. He would fly 200 and something miles a day, and he never really stopped. He just, you could see, he just variated off the pattern just a little bit, but he was basically following the latitude all the way up. How on earth do these things know that? They have a knowing inside of them. So somewhere in there, we've got to realize before the fall, when they were in the Garden of Eden and they were created, all of these things we call creation were worshiping God. So they are releasing a sound. They are releasing some kind of praise back to their creator. Do you get that? Now we also know that after the fall, the enemy, Satan, began to put layers of sin onto creation and onto humans. And as the layers of sin came on, what happened was it was really hard for creation to worship with that burden. Do you see? It was really hard for them to have their original frequency. It was really hard for them to be who they were supposed to be. It was, and they're still, it's still in them. They're still wanting to worship their creator. But it's all this weight that is on them. Okay? <clears throat> I believe that all creation is still trying to worship their creator. I think the animals are. I think the, but I think, again, it's the perversion that sets on them. We know that we are God's servant rulers and that's the best way I could probably describe who we are we're servants to God but he has instilled that we are the rulers over this planet we are the rulers we're the ones who are supposed to be taking care of it we're supposed to be stewardship we're supposed to be managing this planet somehow and you know one of our biggest assignments to me and this is what the Lord has given me the message for is to remove the sin off creation and off of people. That's why if you don't have that piece that I call the foundational piece for our house, if you don't understand the sins are forgiven piece that we understand in John 20, 23, you need to go back to the web, to the YouTube site and look up under foundations and re-watch the uh, new revelation of forgiving or forgiveness. The reason is until you get until you get it inside of you that every single day you wake up, you should be removing sin from something. Every single day. What we do is we forget to remove the sin. 
and we just put up with the garbage that's coming off people and animals and land and weather, okay? It's real hard for you to control the weather if you don't get rid of the sin that's rooted in it. The weather didn't create the sin. It's us humans that have created the sin and all these things. So somewhere in you, I've, you've got to get to the biggest, biggest assignment is for us to realize we are after a harvest. But we're not only after a harvest of people, we're after a harvest of creation bringing them back to original design. If you literally go through your day and you do not remove any sin, you've wasted one of your precious days. There is something you should be removing from somebody and something every day. You drive down the road and you see a church, you should say, I say the sins are forgiven off that church and I remove everything that the enemy has laid onto them. There should not be a field or a tree. Do you hear what I'm saying? That you're not saying. Some of you complain about your yards and your gardens and your things. Have you removed the sin? Have you removed the sin off of it? So it could go back to creation. When you really get the sin off things, they begin to praise and worship God the way they were designed to do. If you want to hear something, we, we laughed when Holly was describing the soul one day. Okay. She almost had a rapture moment. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you. She was describing how she had worked and worked with this soil, took the sins off, did it, and got it back to all but its original design to the point she could just scoop her hand down and go deep into the soil and pick up this plant. Isn't that pretty amazing? That's why she was rapturing out. She was, oh my gosh, guys, you could just you could just dig your hand in there and you could just pick up that. See, now all the rest of us are like, okay, what, what? What's she talking about? But she understands that particular area was redeemed. And it was so redeemed, it got, go, it got to go back to original design, as close as she had been able to get it yet. And... I sat there and thought about it. Gary tried to put a political sign up in our yard, and he had to actually drill holes into the ground <laughs> to stick the wire things in. Do you see the difference? What she was bringing to us is a picture none of us could even imagine. This is what redeemed looks like. But that's what I'm saying. Somewhere inside of you, somewhere, You've got to get the part what God is saying to you. So let's look at Romans 8 and see what he is giving our destiny to be. What is he saying we're supposed to be doing? Okay. Romans chapter 8, verse 18. <laughs> I am convinced that any suffering we endure is less than nothing compared to the magnitude of glory that is about to be unveiled within us. The entire universe. People, that's pretty much everything. The entire universe is standing on tiptoe, yearning to see the unveiling of God's glorious sons and daughters. You get this. It's like they're waiting for us to start the play. They're waiting for us to perform. They're waiting for us to get it. And they're just like, oh, come on, guys. You've got everything you need to do to overcome every bit of evil in your life. What is the problem? <laughs> Can't you just hear them up there? Just like, oh! To reveal, to unveiling of God's glorious sons and daughters. For against its will, the universe itself has had to endure the empty futility. Another way of saying that is they had to endure the chaos created by the enemy. They've had to endure the chaos. Okay. Result of the chaos resulting from the consequences of human sin. We, our ancestors, everybody else brought this chaos because the enemy did. But now, 
with eager expectation. All creation longs for freedom from its slavery to decay and to experience with us the wonderful freedom coming to God's children. If you could hear the trees saying, please take this off of me. Please take this off of me. If you could hear the homes you live in say, please don't make us carry the sounds of all the chaos that we've been <coughs> exposed to. Remove those sounds from the wood. Remove those sounds from the brick and the mortar. Remove those sounds from appliances and things like that. See, it sounds silly, but all matter has an ending. And it's just waiting for you. Now, creation is that which we're looking at. To this day, we are aware of the universal agony and the groaning of creation as if it were in the contractions of labor for childbirth. And it's not just creation. We, who have already experienced the first fruits of the Spirit, also inwardly groan as we passionately long to experience our full status as God's sons and daughters, including our physical bodies being transformed. For this is the hope of our salvation. He's saying we have the ability to walk here on earth in the fullness of everything he's given us. Can you imagine walking every single day without pain, without sickness, without headaches, without doubt, without fear, without worry, without concern? Can you imagine what it would be like to sleep all night long without having frustration? This is what he just said. This is what you are allowed to do. This is what our inheritance is. This is what our destiny is. So when we look at that, what we have to remember is a lot of times you can watch and see how we literally um, treat nature is pretty much reflecting our attitude towards God and who he created and what he created. It really is. If you treat nature like it's just a disposable thing, like it's <laughs> just there to minister to you, and you don't have any care for it, you don't really care about it that much, you're really talking about a disrespect you have. You know, I've watched this forever. Um, <clears throat> those of us that, Stacy was laughing about some people, some workers were coming in and out of her pasture and she had to finally put a note on, please close the gate. Okay, anybody that was raised on a farm or in any kind of wisdom knows you go through a gate that's closed, you close it. If you go through a gate that's open, you leave it open, okay? These are just hard, fast rules, okay? But there are so many people that that doesn't mean anything to them because they're, the way they treat treat creation is like, you're there to just be mine. You're a disposable thing. Do you understand what I'm saying? You can tell by the way people love the land or don't love the land. Do you have a love for your land that you live on? Do you, do you treat it in your mind as if it's a living thing? as if it has the ability to bless you back? Have you ever noticed the people that, and this is an example, I'm just giving you examples, <clears throat> that when they pull up in someone's house, they have no problem pulling up into their lawn mm -hmm. instead of staying on there. Do you hear what I'm saying? Do you hear what I'm saying? And I see that a lot. Now, I understand if you only have three car spaces and you have extra people, okay? We do that a lot. But have you noticed how some people, it's all the same to them? They don't care if you've worked on your lawn, okay? They don't care about that. They just go right over it. 
Do you think they're caring? I wonder if this lawn cares if I run over it. <laughs> the lawn may not get to say it, but the owner should, right? So again, do we show our respect towards the creator? If, if I was given a gift and I disrespected the gift, would I be disrespecting the giver? If I said, you know, I don't really like this. Is this what you thought? This you thought would be a good gift for me? You know, I don't even like this stuff. Do you hear? Do we do that to creation? Somewhere you've got to shift your thinking, shift your mind to realizing you, as this destiny God's given you, all of creation is waiting for you to grow up and take your place. They're waiting for you to become the sons and daughters of the Most High King. They're waiting for you to step it up and say, okay, today I'm going to take a lot of sin out. You see the difference? Okay. So look at John, <coughs> First John chapter 1. Let's see, I know I'm going to go chapter 4. <coughs> I think this is the piece that I had to have before I could really come into understanding all of this. And it's the fact that really God is love. We all know that. We all hear it. We can all speak it. We all got it. <clears throat> but the problem is we don't believe it. Uh, 1 John chapter 4. I'm going to start with verse 7. <coughs> Excuse me. Those who are loved by God, let his love continually pour from you to one another. Because God is love. Everyone who loves is fathered by God and experiences an intimate knowledge of him. The one who doesn't love has yet to know God, for God is love. <clears throat> it's real hard. It means it's to shine. If you see people that are not very loving and they can't really love, if you keep digging in the roots, you're going to find that the biggest thing is they have not felt love. They don't know how to give love if they've not felt love. Now in their head they've heard God is love and he loves me. But if they've had barriers of all the wrong things around them they cannot feel his love. Do you hear me? They cannot sense that he is loving them. The light of God's love shined within us when he sent his matchless son into the world so that we might live through him. This is love. He loved us long before we loved him. It was his love and not ours. He proved it by sending his son to be the blessing, sacrificial offer to take away our sins. Now that he has done that, now that we have been redeemed, we have the authority and the ability to look at land and creation and everything else. And you, if you would be sensitive enough, please hear me, you could literally feel, see, or smell, or actually know where the sin is. You can actually feel the vibrations. Most of you are somewhat aware of evil. You can feel it when it's really, really bad. Okay. I know a lot of you aren't quite as sensitive, but most of you, when you walk into a truly evil place, you'll go, blood of Jesus. <laughs> right? <coughs> but what you don't <coughs> realize is you're not as sensitive to evil if it's in a lesser format. Okay. Or if it's something you've heard every day. If you've heard a certain frequency of evil every day, you become desensitized to it. You can't do anything but hear it all the time. And pretty soon you do what my beloved Gary does, and he no longer pays attention to that sound that his wife is saying. <laughs> do you hear me? Anybody like that? He's very gifted. Discernment. Discernment. <laughs> very gifted. But we do that with this thing that evil, and what happens is then you can't feel the love of God because what you've replaced it with are those other things. All right. So <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about animals and plants and weather and everything else. 
if we believe what I taught just a little while ago, that all of creation was created to be a blessing to us humans and to praise and worship God, then we've got to realize somehow they're all communicating. Okay. I've told you before, I believe the Garden of Eden was very much like Adam could understand everybody that was talking. Okay. He could understand every animal, every plant. He was there to manage he was there to steward. Now, some people believe that because of that, there was nothing to steward. Okay. I don't think so. I think he had to go in and probably had to do some kind of managing, or why would God put him up to steward? If it was self-sufficient, they wouldn't have needed him, right? So he had to have some kind of managerial skill. But I began to look and think about some of the things in the Bible that we don't think of very often with creation. How many of you remember Balaam's donkey? <coughs> remember the donkey <coughs> that would not pass? <laughs> okay. And the, they were beating on him and everything else. But the donkey was seen. Did you ever think that creation may see into that spirit realm? It's very probable they still see. They still see all the evil that's there. That's what this donkey did. He was like, uh, I'm not going there. Okay, right? And finally, he had God had to actually give him the ability to voice his voice in the language so they'd stop beating on him. Didn't they? Now, I don't know about you. I know Candy is a dog whisperer. <laughs> we call it the dog whisperer. I have people in my life that are the horse whispers, you know. You have all these people. I don't know any cat whispers. Do you have any cat whispers in here? Maybe Rachel. They wouldn't listen. They wouldn't listen. <laughs> <laughs> Gary doesn't think cats listen, Rachel. You're going to have to work. <clears throat> but everybody seems to have some kind of a tune to, you know, what they're saying and what they're doing. But I sit there and I think about it. If these animals are still talking, and we are supposed to be redeeming everything back to original design. You know, one of those things you need to redeem is you. Yes, absolutely. So you can hear the animals talking. You can hear the trees talking. You can hear when you pick up the soil what it's saying. You can hear when you just casually touch someone on the shoulder what they're saying. We're supposed to be redeeming ourselves, right? So I also think about um, Jonah and the whale. You know, every, everybody always focuses on Jonah. I personally think about the poor whale. Me too. Okay. I mean, you know, think of the whale. Something caught in my throat. Something caught in my throat. No, the whale had to hear his creator are you listening? He had to hear his creator go, okay, I need you to go to this part of the ocean. I'm about to dump somebody in. And I need you to swallow. Chewy, Not chewing. Don't chew it. Just kind of holding there in your mouth. How much discipline did the fish have? That's what I'm saying. He heard his creator. And then he's having to swim around for days. Waiting for this guy to repent. <laughs> now think about that. I've heard many people talk about by the time Jonah would have been spit out, he would have looked like a white yeah. bleached, you know, because of the enzymes inside the <laughs> belly of this whale. Now, not only that, okay, think about the poor whale. And God's just giving him the wisdom. You go, and then he has to give him the coordinates of where to dump him out. <laughs> they weren't in the same place. Okay. So somehow, and I, I can just see it now. I'm sitting here looking and thinking the whale. Can you imagine what the whale's thinking? Okay, come on, stupid guy. Just repent. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just repent. Repent. Say, we're going to go there. Let's get this over with. We could have had this done the first day. <laughs> But no, you had to drag it out. <laughs> and whine. 
and carry on. <laughs> Do you he hear? Huh? But did he die? But did he die? <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to tell you all what's going on. <laughs> Apparently during one of my sessions with Stacy, I was so frustrated with her apparently because she was going on about how horrible her life was and all this stuff and she went on and on probably for a lengthy amount of time. <laughs> and finally I said to her, but did you die? She never forgot that. <laughs> she's, learned the lesson well. she's learned a lesson. We've done inner healing. We've tried to get over that. I've even said, who said that to you? She goes, you did. <laughs> My point was, you didn't die. Okay. So we still got stuff to work with. If you die, you're outside of my hands. I can't do anything. You didn't die. But can you imagine this poor girl? I can't swallow. <laughs> Just got get, indigestion. Got indigestion. Yeah, that kind of take all this. Probably uncomfortable. Uncomfortable, you know. Just think about it. And he had to, you know, not. I, there had to be some kind of protection for he didn't actually dissolve yeah. with all the acid and everything that's in the enzymes in the stomach. Acid. <clears throat> but then he finally heard God say, "Okay, he's he got there." So he repented. Jonah did, and finally the whale was allowed to spit him out. Vomit him out onto this area of this beach. Wow. <laughs> okay, just think about this. This is this poor whale. All of creation is looking at us probably like that whale. <laughs> like, please, we want to spit you out, but we can't because you haven't repented and you haven't taken the sin off the land. And we're all stuck here. Every time you try and kill them, they're thinking, I didn't do it. You did it. <laughs> okay. But can animals do this? Can animals, does God want them to praise him? Well, let's just look and see what it says. Look at Psalms 19. Let's just put a foundation of what's allowed to praise and recognize their creator. In Psalm 19, we're talking about the skies. See, we talk about creation down here, like the plants, the animals. But creation is everything you see. Stars universes, planets. Verse 1, God's splendor is a tale that is told. His testament is written in the stars. It means they're rehearsing the glory of God. The stars rehearse, 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 rehearse the glory of God. Okay. Space itself speaks his story every day. I don't think people are getting that when they look through their telescope. But if you took the sins off of that, they would. They would see that every single day, space itself is speaking of his story. Through the marvels of heaven. So space itself speaks his story every day through the marvels of heaven. His truth is on tour in the starry vault of the sky. Showing his skill in creation's craftsmanship. This is the Maserat. The signs, you would call them the signs of the Zodiac. They are literally every day doing this. They're like on tour. That's why when we have each month, we have a constellation. We have a sign of that, that particular month. So that it goes with it. It helps you understand the story that Jesus is trying to convey to you this month through the stars. It's like the first movie. It's like the first written word of God. It's like the first anything. People would lay on their roofs every night and study the stars to hear what he was saying. He would tell them what was coming in the future. Do you see anybody doing that today? Um... Each day gushes out its message. Another way of saying it is, it prophesies. What is this month? The month we're supposed to be prophesying. So every day, it just prophesies. All of these stars, all of these creations are prophesying and prophesying. Night with night, it's whisperings, it's knowledge to all. That's what the stars are doing. 
Without a sound, without a word, without a voice, they're being heard. Because they're a frequency and they're coming. Yet all the world can see its story. Everywhere is its gospel is clearly read so that many may know. That's why I can literally take you each constellation and when you look at the names of the stars, you can tell the story of Jesus. It literally tells the story of Jesus. And that's, I mean, that he designed that that way. It wasn't an accident, people. Now look at Psalms 100 and, um, let's see, I think I want to do 148. <laughs> This is where you hear the whole orchestra. I think it's so hard for us because we're so familiar with just our own sounds, our own human sounds. We don't know. If I could just explain it to you like this. Let's say there are a hundred dimensions of God. And animals can hear a lot of times a lot more sounds than you can hear. We know that. We know dogs can hear. We, we understand that. But what I'm trying to share with you is that's not really truth. The truth is, you have just carried so much sin weight and roots of iniquity in us that we no longer hear those sounds because we have had them programmed out of us so that we don't hear what the dogs hear. We don't hear what the dolphins hear. We can't speak the language of dolphin. But this is what he's trying to say. He created them so that we, as the managers of this planet, how can you manage something you can't talk to? How can you manage somebody or help somebody you can't communicate with? Have you ever tried to talk to someone that doesn't speak English? It's a little bit of a challenge. My favorite thing is when everybody starts speaking slower and louder. Yeah. <laughs> With an accent. With an accent. Oh, that's my favorite. One of our children did that all the time. Whatever the accent of the person was, they mimicked it. And with some of the cultures, it was really wrong. Okay, And they would mimic it in public, and people would get offended. And I'm like, shh, hush. But he thought it was fun saying it like they said. My point is, you are not hearing these sounds because you've not been taught you can. If you remove the sin off your hearing, off your communications, you would be able to hear them praise. Because I want to read this to you so you can see. He literally, literally, literally created everything to communicate. And everything has a sound. And when they're all releasing their sounds of praise, it's an orchestra. This animal has this instrument. This animal has this one. The stars have this one. We humans have this one. It's an orchestra of praise. You and I, as the managers of God's earth, are designed to remove that sin so every one of those creation creatures can release their sound. Look at Psalms 148. <clears throat> it's literally called the Cosmic Chorus of Praise. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Let the skies be filled with praise and the highest heavens with the shouts of glory. Now, see, we hear that and what we think is, it's us saying it. We always take it back to our selfish little me. You know, God's talking to me. Well, let's see if he is. Go ahead and praise him, all you messengers. Those are angels. Praise him some more, all you heavenly hosts. Hmm. Those could be saints. Those could be a lot of things. Keep it up, sun and moon. The sun is praising God. The moon is praising God. Don't stop now, all you twinkling stars of light. What does he not want them to stop? Praising. Praising. Take it up even higher. 
Can you just see God wanting to or to be the orchestra leader? Come on, come on. I need more sound here. I need this. Come on, let's get back in rhythm. That's what he's trying to do. Take it up even higher, up to the highest heavens, until the cosmic chorus thunders his praise. It literally means in that particular thing, the waters above the sky. Remember where it all started? With the waters. This is what he's trying to say. Let the entire universe erupt with praise to God. I don't think you're grasping it. <coughs> the entire universe, the black holes, do you hear me? <coughs> Everything. From nothing to something, he spoke and created it all. He established the cosmos to last forever. And he stands behind his commands. So his orders will never be revoked. Let the earth join in with this parade of praise. You mighty creatures of the ocean's depths, echo in exaltation. All those waves. Lightning, hail, snow, clouds, and the stormy winds that fulfill his words, they have a sound of praise. <coughs> Are you getting this yet? Hail, snow, lightning has a sound of his praise. Can't you just hear lightning come in as a crash for the orchestra? <coughs> because they're there to fulfill his word. Bring your melody, O mountains and hills, trees of the forest and field. Harmonize your praise. I just wish this morning, this is my greatest wish this morning, is that you could hear the redeemed orchestra of God. That you could hear these things being released. They are groaning because we as humans have allowed the chaos to stay in them. They are groaning. They can't make the right sound that it's talking about here because they carry this chaos weight of sin. And until you, the redeemed sons and daughters of God, remove that sin, they're stuck. They're stuck. Read it again. Bring your melody, O mountains and hills, trees of the forest and field. Harmonize your praise. Praise him, all beasts and birds and mice and men, kings and queens and princes and princesses, young men and maidens, children and babies. Old and young alike, everyone, everywhere. Let them all join in with this orchestra of praise. It's not just you. Yes, you're supposed to praise your most high God. Yes, you're supposed to be worshiping him. Yes, you're supposed to be declaring him. But too many think it's just about them. And they don't realize they're part of the orchestra. It's not a human orchestra. It's not a human orchestra. For the name of the Lord is the only name we raise. His stunning splendor ascends higher than the heavens. He anoints his people with strength and authority, showing his great favor to all his godly lovers. He anoints you. This is what Jesus did on the cross. He's anointing you and giving you this authority and this strength to remove this chaos from creation. Showing his great favor to all his godly lovers, even to his princely people Israel, who are so close to his heart. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Wow. So we get this. Do we recognize those sounds of worship in creation? When Holly was about to rapture out on her dirt, that was a moment because that dirt was loving Holly back. And Holly was recognizing the creator God redeemed this dirt. And it's talking to her and she's talking to it 
And they are playing in the dirt and they're singing and praising God. You get this. All right. <clears throat> History in most of our Western church believes that it's called Reformed theology. And most of the denominations and most of Christianity through history has believed this. They believe that the world is seriously corrupted as a result of Adam's sin. Can we all agree? The world is corrupted. It's in a fallen state. So the people that believe this, also their whole thing is that they just struggle to live in this devastated world that is destined for destruction. They believe this whole world is going to be destroyed. Hear me. So they are just struggling to live in this toxic world until Jesus comes back to grab them. Okay? So that's their mindset. And they are loving Jesus, and they are getting people born again, and to the best of their knowledge, they're doing what they need to do. They don't understand Psalms 148. They don't understand the missional assignment that Jesus gave them to redeem the land. He said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So they think that's later when he comes back. They don't realize it's right now. It's right now. Now there's another group, and you and I have dealt with them a lot <clears throat> in this world. They're called the enlightened worldview. Okay. In the Enlightened worldview, this is basically a product of Greek thinking and Western education. And what they believe is that this world is wonderful in its natural state. Okay? This world is just beautiful just the way it is. This is the foundation for most of the modern environmentalist movements. Okay? But since the world is so wonderful in its natural state, the more people interfere with that natural state, the more they mess up that which is good. Okay, this is their belief. So Mother Earth in their mind is very fragile. It's a living thing, but you need to te touch it and be with it in very tender, loving care. Just don't mess with it. Just leave it alone. So the, this is what most people don't realize is it's a philosophy of Buddhism and a lot of uh, tribal people that just really believe that um, nature is perfect and humanity is best when it comes into harmony with nature. All right? So I want you to kind of get this understanding. But I want you to understand what they're missing is the piece that God created nature, but he did not create nature in its present chaos. Okay. So when we allow the enemy to have his present chaos and his natural state without realizing there is some management that needs to take place, we need to remove the chaos or the sin weight so that that natural original state will come back. But because they focus so much on uh, carbon emissions okay, or climate change or all of these things, they're not understanding that in this fallen state, which they consider is the natural state, just leave it alone and it'll all be fine. Okay? But there is something. We're supposed to be caretakers. We're supposed to be stewards, original design. So the way we kind of kind of have to look at it is the earth is good. Who created it? God. It's God's creation, so we know it's good. But he, it can be better. We can take the sin off of it so that it can go back to the original design, not the natural design that's in our minds, that's in our history that we know. Okay. I mean, I, I still have people saying to me, oh, if the world were just like it was 50 years ago, it'd be so much better. And I go, okay, how would it be so much better? Well, we just didn't have this nonsense. I go, no, you didn't have people telling you you had this nonsense. You still had the nonsense. You just didn't know about it. Because there weren't reporters out there reporting it to you. <laughs> all right, it's been there all the way back. Okay. So we figured out that animals can think, animals can communicate, 
We know that all matter has memory. We know that we're the sons and daughters of God. <coughs> Will the land cry out for us to help it go back to original design? Do you believe the land's crying out to you? Yeah, yeah. Will the animals cry out to us? Do you think the animals are crying out to us? Do you think they're really wanting us to help them? I do too. <clears throat> One of my stories that in, in all my studies from years and years ago <clears throat> about healing the land, and this is a book by John Sanford, I came across this story and I could never shake it. Okay. Because it just, I just had never thought of it like that. Just, at that time, this is about 20 years ago, I just never thought of it like that. But I want to read you this story, and actually this is a story that was taken from history, and it was put into a book by um, a veterinarian who was teaching veterinarians how to be um, skilled in, in understanding animals. Okay. And she was using several examples of where the animals in creation had come to humans for needs and for things. <clears throat> and when I read this story, I kept thinking, well, God, I don't remember, you know, animals really being like that with me. And he goes, well, they're always coming to the light. And they're, they're designed to want to help you. I mean, that's how their original design is. When the sin comes over them, they can't help you much because they're supposed to attack you. Okay. But he gave me an example. And it was an example of I was raised on a working ranch and we had a lot of horses. And we had this one cutting horse that was just, he was just sweet, okay? His name was Pete, and he just had all these different gates. You could just, like, it was like rocket when you got to riding. And it was just a wonderful experience, but he was a roping horse, too. And so <clears throat> we were trying to corral this one calf who was a little bit older, had already been weaned, but we needed to get him out of the pasture. So my father, on Pete, tried over and over again to rope this calf, okay? And he'd get really close, and then the calf would jump another way, and it'd all be over. And this went on and on, and finally my dad actually dropped his lariat, and so he had to get off of the horse and go pick up his lariat, okay? The horse was so frustrated with my dad. He went over put his head on the other side of that calf and hunked it up against him and held him <laughs> while my dad put the rope on. <laughs> okay. And we're all just kind of standing there. Like, the horse was so tired of my dad's inability to get this calf. I mean, literally, we, we all just stood there. Dad said, y'all seeing this right? Because he thought he was crazy. Okay. Uh, but he held him. Just held that cap. It was a big one. Just held that cap up against him until Dad put the rope on him. We still laughed about that. Dad said, it's, you know, animals need to help us, right? <laughs> so when I read this story, <coughs> that's what hit me. Pete, in his unredeemed situation, was still trying to help the humans. Okay. The flawed human. How many times would the animals like to come to your door and say, could you help me? <laughs> would you help me? Now, let me make this clear, all you mercy people. It does not mean you have to pick up every abandoned cat, dog, and animal. Okay, I'm not, I know, I'm not saying that, so hear me well. <clears throat> so I just want to read this to you. Around the turn of the 5th century, there was a man following what was then called the anchorite mode, it literally meant a solitary life of prayer and a rule of life from who two monks had set out to find him. They were indeed coming from a distant region, but they had once been the object of his special affection when they lived in a monastery and they had heard subsequently of his miracles. After a long and intensive search, they finally found him in the seventh month living on the very edge of a desert near Memphis. This is not Memphis, Tennessee. <laughs> he was said, it was said that he had been inhabiting these solitudes for 12 years. 
In spite of his desire to avoid any meeting with men, he did not flee from the visitors when they recognized him. He recognized them. He even devoted himself for three days to their friendly demands. On the fourth day, when these two travelers were leaving, he went for, they went forward a short distance, he did, to accompany them. And suddenly they saw a lioness, remarkable size, coming towards them. The beast, although confronted with three men, had no hesitation as to which she would approach. She then lay down at the feet of the anchorite. Okay. Lying there, she whimpered and whined and gave signs of grieving at the same time of asking for something. And all three men were moved, especially the anchorite, since the request was directed to him. I want you to hear this. The lioness went ahead and they followed, and she stopped from time to time. From time to time, she had looked back at them, making it clear that she wanted what was the anchorite should follow her, and she would watch to see if he was. Why the lengthened tail? They came to the beast's cave. Here the unfortunate mother nourished five cubs, now well grown, who were born with closed eyes and had been blind ever since. One by one, the mother brought them from the cave and laid them at the feet of the anchorite. At last, the saint saw what the beast was asking for. He called on God's name, and with his hand, he touched the closed eyes of the cubs. At once, the darkness was dispelled, the beast's eyes were opened, and the light long denied them shone in. This done, the brothers returned. They had visited the anchorite they were eager to see and had received a very rich reward for their toil. They had become witnesses of a great miracle. As well as the saint's faith, they had seen Christ's glory to which they were called to testify. The story embraces still another miracle because after five days, the lioness returned to her benefactor, bringing him as a gift the skin of a rare animal. The saint would frequently wear this as a mantle, not the climbing to receive from the beast a gift he believed to have quite another source. Mm. Isn't that amazing? Wow. Okay. I think the enemy has done a number on us. He's made us believe that this is all there is. Yeah. He's made us believe that we can't hear those animals, that we can't heal them, that we can't but the animals know. It says they're literally groaning. The land is literally groaning, waiting for you to take your place. What is your place? I think your place is where you walk into the redeemed place of the Lord. You start realizing there's a whole lot more than three or four dimensions. You start realizing, I need to ascend up higher and I need to do that with the tools that he's given us. And the tools he's given us is praise. The tools he's given us is worship. The tools he's giving us is love and joy. All of those are tools. Now, we know we have the blood of Jesus. We have the name of Jesus. We have his authority. We have that to do in warfare. But in praise, that too is a warfare. It's where we take back the sounds that the enemy has kept us from hearing. We take back what the enemy has stolen. So stop looking at the world around you and seeing all the junk and the evil and focusing on that. And see it as a sign from God, get rid of this. Remove this. And we start with ourselves. So I want to pray for us to repent for not allowing our hearing, which is another message from this month. It's a month to hear, a month to hear differently, so that we can hear creation. And we can be the good stewards 
to help them. If they are bound up, we should be speaking to them. Why are we not? So let's just do that this morning. <clears throat> Father God, I just thank you that just as your word has shown us, you created all of us to praise. You created all of us. All creation, the sun, the moon, the fish, the birds, the wind, the land, the animals, all of us to praise you. And Father, we realize we have got to stop. We've got to stop being in that place where we say, it's not my problem, it's not my assignment. I am too busy taking care of my own self and my own problems because it is our assignment. So, Father, I first off want to be the one that says, I repent. I repent for not taking my assignment seriously. I repent for the selfishness of saying, my comfort and my agenda and my desires are more important than yours. I repent for that. I repent for not wanting my brothers and sisters in Christ to hear their sounds of praise. I repent for not taking your word in John 20, 23. What sins you forgive or remit will be remitted. What sins you retain will be retained. Father, we will no longer be a party to that. And we will step out. And every second of our day, whether it's our home, our car, our business, our church, our ministries, anything, wherever you look, Holy Spirit, quicken to us. Did you remove the sin off of that? Did you remove the sin off of that? Layers and layers and layers of sin the enemies put on. Generations of roots of iniquities. Did you remove the sin off that? So, Father, we come today with real repentant hearts. Forgive us. Forgive us for being so selfish. We could not hear that we weren't a solo act in the orchestra of God. Forgive us for not wanting to be a part of all the orchestra. So let us understand all the orchestra needs to sing. <coughs> all the orchestra needs to praise God. All the orchestra needs to be in place. And together, the praises of God will ascend to you. So Father, as we come to you this morning, Wash us in your word. Wash us in your blood. And we say all sin, the layers of sin that Satan's put on us culturally, regionally, in our inheritances, generationally, even the ones we've personally done ourselves. We say the sin is forgiven. And we ask the blood to cover it and remove it. So we can hear those animals. We can hear their cries. We can hear the land's cry. We can do all that. So we come to stay home. And we join in your praise. We join in your glory. We join in your praise. We sing the highest levels of prayer. Can you agree? Amen. He's laid out three very beautiful songs. And I believe in this space and this time of worship, we have a chance to lay down those things. We have a chance to come out of agreement with that which has been silencing the sounds of God from reaching us. His sounds, his frequencies are always with
with us and around us, just like Yolanda said, the things block. And so this day, we get to offer those to him. Those things that will no longer help us because they are of the enemy, we lay down today, Lord, and we put them at your feet.
as we give up those things at your feet, as we come out of agreement with those things, we ask for the filling. We ask that your Holy Spirit fills the cup. For we cannot deliver to the land or to people or to creation or whatever. We cannot deliver what we do not have. And so we ask for your filling. We ask for your filling. We ask for your new wine that we may pour it out upon the land, that we may pour it out upon the people and all of creation.
present tense. 
not the future, it is now. It is now. Mm -hmm. Now we're in the <laughs> We're narrowing it down. Potter, Potter. Okay, Desiree, just tell us what it is. I, you just have to open your mouth. I know you don't know. I know. I feel it. I just, I just don't know what it is. Okay, then stand up and open your mouth and just say whatever you say. What are you feeling? The Father, we just give it to her, right? Now. Show us what it is. Stand firm in all that you know and all that you have been taught in redeeming yourselves in the land and go forth. And now is the time for it to happen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yes.